Hello and welcome. Today we're going to talk about Amanita muscaria. Um, how many have heard of this mushroom before? Most of you? Good. Um, and the other word on this slide, ethnomycology. What does that mean to anyone? Yeah. Um, just like how mushrooms relate to culture. Yeah. So we can break this down, right? So ethno, like ethnic, is culture. And then mycology, obviously this is a mycology class. So in this lecture, I'm going to be telling you some biological facts about Amanita muscaria, um, but it's always going to be lensed through a particular cultural framework. And in fact, we're going to jump around between many cultural frameworks. And probably the biggest takeaway that I want you to take away from this lecture is that um, there is no one objectively correct way to view this mushroom. And in fact, even the biological framework comes with its own cultural baggage and underpinnings. Um, so I'm going to try to show you this mushroom from many different perspectives, and in so doing, maybe we can understand the way the mushroom perceives itself. I know that sounds a little strange, um, but that's, that's going to be what we're aiming at. Um, so we're going to start with TikTok, because that's where I am in the world at the moment. Um, so I'm going to show you a bunch of TikToks about mushrooms. Some of these are about Amelia muscaria, some of them are not. Um, and the purpose of this introductory slide is just to give you a general sense of the way that people in the world think and talk about Amanita muscaria and mushrooms more generally. Um, and then we can unpack what those different perspectives might mean. Um, so we can start with this lovely woman who found an Amanita muscaria. Uh, mute? I didn't even see you all the way from here. Oh, oh wow, friend. Oh, wow. Oh, you're the biggest friend I've ever met. Look at you. Look at how large my friend is. Oh, I don't even want to give you pats. Oh, well, so very gentle. It's important to be very gentle. You're the biggest one I've ever seen. Wow. You're the big daddy, sir, aren't you? Look. Also, look at the little guy. Okay. All right. So, that's enough of that. Um, so, so what can we take from, from that video? Well, th there, there's a woman, and there's a mushroom, and the woman is very excited about the mushroom, and that's, you know, that, that, that's a good place to start. Um, but what you'll find is that Amanita muscaria, like, occupies a, a very interesting place in our cultural consciousness about mushrooms. Um, it, it's very iconic looking, right? Like, you've probably seen it in Mario games. That's probably, I imagine, the first time any of you saw that mushroom was in a Nintendo video game, which is strange. Um, so I'm going to show you another meme. This is of a human dressed up as a mushroom because that's what we like to do. Oh, Steven, there's one more thing I had to mention. What is it? I love you. Bye. Right. Um, so. TikTok is replete with stuff like this, right? It, it's, there's its own genre of like dressing up as Amanita muscaria. Um, and more so than any other mushroom species. And, and I, there, there are reasons for that, right? Like people have been imagining themselves as mushroom, and particularly this mushroom, for thousands of years. Um, and that in and of itself should be an interesting fact, right? Like I don't think most of the people on TikTok who are dressing up as Amanita muscaria have ever consumed the thing. But nonetheless, they feel compelled to present themselves as that, right, for, for whatever mimetic reasons. Um, so before we do dive too deeply into Omni Lascar, I'm going to show you a little bit of TikTok discourse that I have participated in, um, because it pertains more broadly to representation, right? Like the, the way that we represent these mushrooms matters, and it's not actually possible to talk about them without reflecting something of ourselves, because we're humans and we speak. Mushrooms don't speak, only we speak. Right, so uh, I'm going to show you a TikTok uh, by probably the largest mushroom TikToker. Her name is, his name is Dr. Gordon Walker. Um, he's got a PhD in mycology. He's got like a million followers. And he has a very distinctive video style, which you're about to see. Um, all right, here we go with this. So this is a gymnopolis. Gymnopolis. <laughs> Um, I mean, he makes excellent content. Like he makes like high quality mycological content. I'm sure some of you have seen it, right? Like probably of of the TikTok channels out there, he has a, a, a greater variety of different mushroom species that are properly identified. He knows his ecology, like he's. But he's also on TikTok, and so you get sex, right? Um, so uh, 
A while back, I made this video about Arvis. the growth of an Arvis skull. Uh, okay, I want you to pause. Oh, God. Use the growth of an Arvis skull. Right. Invasive. Okay, so the last time I was standing in front of you all, um, we were talking about Arvis skulls, right? And Arvis skulls, does anyone remember what an Arvis skull is? It's about Glomer and Mankata, not about this, but can anyone jog your memory? What's an Arvis skull? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I made this video about arbuscles, and then Gordon comments on my video with this. It's a great explanation. Arbuscular mycorrhiza are more invasive of plant tissues than ectomycorrhizal mycorrhiza. Right. And this is like a, a standard textbook comment. Right. If you read about arbuscular mycorrhiza, you will see this word invasive show up. Like he's not pulling that out of thin air. Like he's he's a scientist. Right. Um, but I took issue with it um, because the word invasion is a, has interesting connotations. Um, so that's what this video is about, is, is the words that we use to describe mushrooms. And um, I'll just play it for you and then we can chat about it for a little bit. Well, is the fungus penetrating the plant? It is. So we could choose to tell a true story about invasion if we wanted to. And Gordon, please do not take this as a criticism. I love your content. But invasive seems to be exactly the kind of word that a man who chooses to slap mushrooms the way he might slap an ass. How much <laughs> your male patterns are showing. And that's fine. I've got some too. I've also got some female patterns that creep into my descriptions of fungus. Is the plant being invaded or is the fungus being enveloped, embraced? Maybe the metaphors we use matter, and there's no way to relate to these microscopic creatures without some kind of descriptive metaphor. Even a technical term like invagination comes with its own gendered baggage, and I don't think that this is a problem. Please keep slapping those mushrooms. It's very hot, but as you do, keep in mind that the gesture doesn't just say something about the mushrooms. It also says something about you. Is the growth of an arbus skull in vain? All right, so that's that's the main point, right? That like as as we move on, and we're going to talk about this specific species, Amelia muscaria. Be aware that there is nothing that I can tell you that actually is independent of who I am, right? Like I'm a biased individual. All of the sources that I'm going to be showing you, they're all biased. They all have their own cultural frameworks. It is not possible to talk about a living creature, let alone a psychoactive living creature, without basically leaking your own selfhood into the discourse. And that's fine, right? Like, it's okay, but we should just be self-aware of that. So, I'm gonna, yeah? Did you get a response from the slapper? Uh, I did. <laughs> was, um, it, was it cordial? Uh, it was cordial. He didn't, he didn't quite get my point. Uh, but he was just like, yeah, that's what the textbooks say. Those are the words that we use. Uh-huh. But like, who wrote those textbooks? Why did they choose the words that they chose? Like, the, these are questions that have impact. Um, yeah. So, we're going to look at a number of different perspectives about Amanita muscaria. We're going to look at pharmacological perspectives, ecological perspectives, as well as indigenous perspectives. And all of them have their own framing and their own way of seeing things. And none of them are right. And all of them are right. Um, so I've got one more video to show you before we go a little bit deeper in, which is underneath this. And this is not actually something that I, as a human being, am capable of addressing. But I want you to consider it. Right, so again, we have another person dressed up as a mushroom. She's very pretty. She's in the forest, right? Like, so this is evoking a particular mood. Um, in all of this representation of this species that we have all over the place, where is the mushroom in that? Like, if you could try to imagine for a moment how Omnina muscaria, as an individual, as a mycological entity, wants to be seen or wants to be represented or wants to communicate, what would that be? Right? Obviously, that's not a question that I can answer. I'm not going to address that question in this lecture, but that is what I want you wondering about. Right? As we look at all these different ways of seeing this species, what, where is the agency of, of the actual creature that we're considering? And how would it represent itself, if it could? Um, so with that, uh, one more video. This one's really cute, of a, a little child who knows more about mycology than maybe some of you. We'll see. Come on. Why is it so quiet? It's a really big wrestler. It's a wrestler, and this is a shrimp wrestler. But this one's got the tip a little bit. Oh, by a slug? Yep. What, what kind of mushroom are you? Not a gibbon. All right. <laughs> 
right? So, so there's, there's hundreds of videos like that, right? And, and so just, again, underneath everything I'm about to show you next, like, try to imagine, like, where is the agency of the mushroom in all of this, and how, how is its desire, it's not that a mushroom can desire, or a fungus can desire, but how is its teleological impulses as a living creature reflected in all of the ways that we treat it and represent it and use it? Um, who knows? <laughs> all right. So now let's do something a little simpler, a little more accessible. Um, so this is a, we're, I'm gonna, I'll, the next slides are all gonna be different perspectives, right? They'll all be titled a certain perspective. So this is a mycology undergrad perspective, right? So this is a photo that was taken by one of my students last summer. Amini mascara grows around here. Obviously the variety that grows around here isn't iconically red, it's Amini mascara vario gesalvi. Um, this mushroom in this picture is in the back. So you can pass that around. Um, this was found at my farm, so it's, it's a fairly common mushroom. It grows all throughout the northern hemisphere. Um, so what can we say about it? Like, what, is, what would a field guide tell us? Well, native throughout the northern hemisphere. Um, it's mycorrhizal with cedar, birch, and other species. It actually partners with a large number of species, um, and it's sort of notable in that it will partner with both gymnosperms and angiosperms, which is somewhat unusual. Um, how do you identify it? Well, it says this here, but maybe I can ask you, what are distinctive features of an Amanita muscaria based on the, the morphology terms that you've learned? So like, if you had to describe this mushroom to me, what would you say? I want you talking. <laughs> yeah. Um, like the scales on the top, mm -hmm. with the word like scabrous or something like that? Yeah. Like the, yeah. yeah, it's got notable scales, what else? Yeah. A universal veil mm -hmm. and a vulva. And a vulva, yeah. So that's, that's those are the things that I wrote down. Right? It's got a, a red cap color, but obviously that varies. It's got warty veil remnants, and annulus, and a vulva. Um, great, right? So that's, that's how you would identify the creature. Uh, and then also, like famously, it contains a compound called muscovol, which functions as a, quote, predator defense toxin. Right? And that's, what, that's the basic explanation you'll see in most guidebooks, like if you ask a, a biologist, a functionalist, like an adaptational functional biologist, like why does Amanita muscaria have muscimol? What's the function of that compound? The answer you would probably get is that it's to defend against predators. Right? And that, that may well be true, um, but that comes with its own sort of adaptationist baggage. Right? There's this idea in most research biology that if you're looking into a trait, in order to understand why the trait is there, you need to come up with some sort of function that the trait holds, right? Like it should, it should offer some kind of adaptive significance. This is sort of like the basic framework that biologists see the world. When we're looking at a creature, say, why do dolphins have fins? Oh, well, because they're aerodynamic and they let it move through the water better. Or why would a mushroom have muscimol? Well, it probably increases its fitness in some way, right? And I don't think that perspective is wrong, right? None of these perspectives are wrong, but saying that muscimol is present specifically or only exclusively as a predator defense toxin, you're gonna miss something. Um, so just put a question mark near that, I suppose, right? Like it's not wrong, it's just like maybe incomplete or maybe there's other ways of understanding why the compound is there. Um, okay, what's next? All right, so now we can look at a Conti perspective. So. Um, for most of these slides, I will include a little map somewhere on there to let you know where in the world this particular piece of information is coming from. Uh, so here we have a little excerpt of a song um, that a Conti person in this region of Russia um, was recorded as singing in 1988 by an anthropologist named Miki Silbet. That's what this says here. So what do we have? Oh, little gold spiked fly agaric, chow, 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 such tidings he brought me, chow, chow, chow. Little patterns, sniped fly, Garrick, chow, chow, chow. Many messages, many words you have, chow, chow, chow. Um, so this is a little inscrutable. Like, what, what does it make you think <laughs> encountering this little piece of poetry? Maybe nothing. Um, but I guess the, the reason why I chose to include this quote as opposed to any of the other bits of that song is that what we'll see over and over is that there is a belief that Amanita muscaria has a message that it wants to convey to us, that it is the way it is because it has information to communicate, um, which is sort of a foreign idea, right? Like, 
If you look in a biology textbook that says that muscimol is there as a predator defense toxin, you won't see it saying that it's trying to communicate with the creatures that it's eating, that are eating it. Um, but that's a very widespread idea in many of these indigenous cultures that we see, that the mushroom itself is trying to communicate with people. And it is the way it is because it has a message to convey. Um, so I'd like you to sort of take that idea somewhat seriously, right? Um, if the mushroom had a message to convey, what would it be? Um, well, we can shift perspectives uh, and get maybe a, a finer, detailed look at what the message actually is, right? So this is muscimol, right? So that's the message if we're, if we're taking a pharmacological perspective, of like a, a strict materialist pattern perspective. Like, this is the message. This is the thing that the mushroom is using to communicate with you. Um, so there's actually two molecules. This one's called ibotenic acid. And this one is called muscimol. Um, and obviously, they're very similar. The only difference between these two molecules is that ibotenic acid has a carboxyl group. Um, so if any of you have taken some amount of organic chemistry, you'll know that decarboxylation is a very uh, ubiquitous uh, digestion step, right? Like, your body has many enzymes that are really good at decarboxylating things. So this compound is readily converted into this compound in the digestive system. Um, and this is the one that is psychoactive. Um, so, how do we know it's psychoactive? Well, if we put our experiment hats on, we know, based on past research, that injections of muscimol and ibotenic acid produce an increase of serotonin and dopamine in the brains of mice and rats. Okay, very interesting, <laughs> right? So, like, to me, that sentence is almost as, like, enigmatic as, as this, right? Like, what, what does this mean? What does it mean when you put this compound into a rat and there's some other molecules that you can measure an increase of. Like it, it, I, in isolation, they don't mean much of anything, right? But we have a framework for understanding the way that these molecules work, and so we can explore them a little bit further. Um, okay, so here we have a molecule called GABA. Have any heard of GABA before? What's GABA? Some of you must know. No? Um, so GABA is a neurotransmitter. What's a neurotransmitter? Yes. Like a chemical message? A chemical message, yes. So your brain has a large number of different kinds of compounds. Dopamine and serotonin that were listed in the earlier slide are, are two of the more famous ones. There's GABA, there's epinephrine, there's norepinephrine. Um, there's, there's a whole suite. There's like 25 major ones. Um, and they're used as signaling molecules for neurons in your brain. So when a neuron fires, it releases, at the end of the synaptic cleft, it releases a bunch of neurotransmitters. They're picked up by the neuron downstream of it, and that neuron fires, and that's, that's how thought works, right? So GABA is one kind of neurotransmitter, um, and it's outside the scope of this lecture for me to say much more about it. I don't actually know much more about it. Um, but what we can see here is that GABA looks like this. Muscimol looks like this, right? And there's this stick model where they're overlaid. And you can see the major difference between muscimol and GABA is that muscimol has this five carbon ring, whereas GABA just has an open, open uh, chain here. But the angles that the, that the atoms take within the molecule are very similar. Um, so what this means is that muscimol and GABA can fit into the same receptor protein. Right? They, they fit into the same lock. Um, so I can read you some of this. Uh, let me read here. Chemical conformations, 3D6, superimposed molecules of GABA and muscimol, the two structures exhibit a tight-fitting alignment of similar atoms. The conformational flexibility of GABA and the stereochemistry of its biosteer analog muscimol allows for affinities with the GABA transporters. So that's a lot of jargon, but basically it means that the molecules are shaped in a similar way, um, and they both will activate these things. Inhibitory glutamate receptors, IGLURs, constitute a class of ion channel proteins equivalent to glycine and GABA receptors. So uh, we don't need to go much deeper in it. Like the, the important thing to recognize is that the molecule in the mushroom is very similar in shape to a molecule in the human brain. Now, how, how could that have happened? Right? Like what, what would be the evolutionary process that would have produced something like that? Um, there are terms for it, right? Like you can talk about coevolution, right? Like this shape matching is probably created through a very similar process that you see shape matching um, in in other 
terrains, right? Like you have hummingbirds with long beaks and flowers that are shaped like trumpets. Like there are lots of examples all over the tree of life of two organisms co-evolving a certain shape. And who knows how much it's co-evolution versus like one party is evolving or the other party isn't. Like we don't actually know very much about how this molecule evolved. Um, but the fit is not random. Like it's there for a reason and there's probably evolutionary pressures that are associated with it. Um, so, hmm. any questions before I move on to this? I, I will say an alternative kind of evolutionary biologist perspective could be that the fit is indeed random, right? Really? And it's just a consequence of natural selection, right? Mm -hmm. Just the mushroom so happened to make a chemical that was similar in combination that was then selected for, right? But it's yeah. randomness essentially that generated that similarity in the first place, and then selection favored it mm -hmm. and allowed it to kind of proliferate through that species. Yeah, I mean, the, the match, at, at its base, it has to be random, because all variation comes from a random engine. Whether it stuck around because it stuck around, or it stuck around because there was a selective advantage to it being there, you could test that. It'd be hard. Um, it's testable. I, I tend to assume, as most biologists assume about most traits, that if you can see them doing something in the world, they're probably functional, they're probably adaptive, there was probably selection to make them that way. Um, but there's always an alternative hypothesis that says, nah, it's just like that. I don't know, <laughs> right? Like you always have to test against that. And actually proving any kind of adaptationist explanation for a trait is surprisingly difficult. Um, most, uh, most functional traits that we see in the world have not been rigorously tested by a peer-reviewed journal. Like we just assume that they're functional and because they're doing a thing. Um, and that's that's like maybe one of the weak spots or strengths in evolutionary biology is that we, we sort of hold ourselves to the standard of needing to provide adaptive explanations for traits, even if they're really hard to come by. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think this is made more complicated by the fact that like the way that we perceive this particular trait varies tremendously according to culture. Um, so what we have here, um, this is a chronosymptomology chart of Amelia muscaria poisoning syndrome. So already in, in this framing, right, so there's, there's always a frame to everything. So I took this out of a paper, and this paper is working with the assumptions that uh, muscimol is a poison, right? And so as a poison, they're going to apply a medical framework to it and say, well, here's the chronosymptomology, right? Here's the symptoms over time that you can experience. So again, none of this is wrong, right? Like, they were good scientists. They, they tested the, the compound and they observed the effects. Um, but they did so using a particular framework. Um, and that framework comes with its own strengths and weaknesses. So what can we say about the effects of this compound on the human psyche, the human being? Right? So you ingest it, you get visual and auditive anesthesia, space and time distortion, madriasis. Then you get tired. Then you get really tired and you fall asleep and you have deep dreams or vivid dreams. And then you're recovered in about eight hours. Right? That's their explanation of this. I was actually surprised to read this, that there's, there's no mention of nausea which I thought was strongly affiliated with, with this mushroom, but nothing I read actually says that it makes you nauseous, which I thought was very interesting. Um, yeah, so that's, then there's this blurb, which, it, which I just took from the paper. It basically says the same thing. Um, a state of confusion, dizziness, and tiredness, visual and auditory anesthesia, hypersensitivity, space distortion, unawareness of time, Presence reinforced by the consumption of other psychosedative agents. Aggressive attitudes have not been reported. Dryness of the mouth, dilation of pupils, hallucinations, vivid color perception, a sense of time standing still are disputed. Right? They're very cautious here. Right? They like I don't know exactly how they got this chronosymptomology chart, but I assume it was like in a controlled laboratory setting where they isolated muscimol, they injected it into a person and watched them. Um, a period of drowsiness after two hours follows with vivid dreams. A deep sleep ends the poisoning, which generally lasts eight hours. So again, like this is a framework where you consider it a poison, right? And when you label something a poison, you're gonna see certain things coming out of that labeling. Um, okay. So um, these are the humans who wrote that paper. Uh, they live in France. The paper was published in 
the Journal of uh, British Mycological Society, right? So that should tell you a little bit about their assumptions and their biases and their, just, just a little bit, right? They're French, that's really all it says, right? Um, so, but like, I have some skepticism of their frame, or not skepticism, but just like I, I want to be hypersensitive to the frame that they come with, um, because I don't think it, it portrays the full story. No frame can portray the full story. And some of these quotes sort of belie that, right? So from this paper, educated people are careful about mushrooms, but those of less developed cultures tend to consume them more readily, right? So you can see in their writing, there's, there's a cultural bias towards their own framework, right? Like these are clearly educated people. They have PhDs in mycology. They think a certain way about it. Um, and they don't, what, the way that they think isn't bad, but it's just, it's French. Um, so chronosymptomology is variable among subjects, depending on rituals and experimental and accidental poisonings, right? So this is their, like, so they recognize that what they observed varies a lot, and it varies a lot based on culture, right? And the way they say that is depending on the subject and whether they're doing rituals or if it's an experimental setting or they're accidentally poisoned, right? So the experience that you have with it will be different if you're doing it in a religious environment, if you're doing it in a laboratory, or if you accidentally eat it on your mushroom foraging trip and you didn't know, right? Like obviously the effects are going to be different in those different scenarios because it's like it's affecting your mind. Um, so, in rituals, the poisoned person, e.g. the shaman, is in search of a particular state of mind where auto-suggestion is important. So, this is how, from, from a more uh, pharmacological framing, we can sort of get at the cultural relativity of this thing. Like they recognize that in a ritual setting, auto-suggestion, meaning what you expect to happen, is going to have a large impact on what actually happens. Um, and that's basically as far as a paper like this can go, right? Because ultimately they're researching the molecule, they're researching the chemistry. And I think they did a pretty good job of telling us what the chemistry is, right? Like I appreciate knowing that muscadol is affecting the same receptors that GABA does and having, having that neurological, pharmacological perspective I think is valuable, um, but it can only take us so far. Um, so now we're gonna go to a completely different part of the world uh, and look at something different, a different story. Um, so I assigned you this story. How many of you actually read it? Some portion of you? Um, so this woman, her name is Kiwe Dinokwe. Uh, she grew up in this region. Garden Island is like a, a particularly historically notable uh, space for the Anishinaabe people. Nobody lives there now, but she did spend a portion of her childhood there. But Anishinaabeg, Anishinaabeg Moen, um, this whole region in the Great Lakes um, was populated by people speaking languages of this family. Um, Kiwe Dinokwe is sort of unique in that she entered the American university system. She got a PhD in ethnobotany, right? She published papers and things, but she comes from a very strong um, Anishinaabeg perspective. Um, so she published a paper um, which is just basically her rendition of a legend about Amini and Muscaria. Um, and I recorded my own abridged version of that to share with you all, because I assumed that not all of you would read the paper. Um, so we're going to watch that. This now. is Kiwe Dinokwe, an Anishinaabeg elder from the Great Lakes region. In 1979, she published a myth about the origins of Amini and Muscaria, and I'm going to share an abridged version of this myth with you right now. Attention! I will tell a story, a story of the people, a story of Miss Guido, that red-topped mushroom, which is the spiritual child of Nokomis Gishik, our grandmother Cedar, and Mimishomis Wigwas, grandfather Birch. Listen and learn. Kiwe Dinokwe tells us of two brothers wandering through the mountains searching for food. They hear a loud buzzing noise coming from a cave, and when they look inside, they see a beautiful green field covered in these red mushrooms with white spots. Handsome Wajashkowe they were, turning and revolving, buzzing and murmuring, singing this strange song of happiness under a brilliantly sunny sky. Quick as a flash of lightning, younger brothers scrambled through the opening, running with joyous abandon into the bed of murmuring mushrooms. Stop! Wait! Stop! cried elder brother. We do not know what spirits there are in this place. The younger brother did not stop. He ran to the tallest, strongest, reddest, most handsome mushroom of them all, and elder brother watched aghast as he became fused to the mushroom stipe and began to grow a bright red cat. Older brother 
terrified, runs back to his village and asks the elders what he should do. They instruct him to climb the tallest tree and pluck feathers from the largest eagle. Then he is to return to that field inside a cave and thrust those feathers inside the mushroom, which was his younger brother, and then pick it and return home. So, older brother climbs the tree, he grabs the feathers, he thrusts them into the mushroom, and lo and behold, it turns back into his younger brother, and they return home together. You're supposed to think at this point that things went back to normal, but they didn't. Older brother fell into a deep depression, while younger brother was smiling each day, his heart filled with happiness. Elder brother noticed that younger brother went behind their wigwam very frequently to urinate, and he stayed much longer than would be necessary, particularly on the full moon. Elder brother went behind the wigwam to investigate, and he found that younger brother had taken a path into the forest. Elder brother followed until he came into a clearing. There, he sees younger brother in the center of an open space, a large group of people around him. Younger brother's arms are open wide, spread like the umbrella of a mushroom. His robes are beautiful, glowing red with tufts of white feathers adorning his head. And with the deep, humming voice of happiness, like the song of uncountable beats, he speaks to the people these words. Because of my supernatural experience in the land of the Misquido, I have a cure to alleviate your ills, to take away all of your unhappiness. If only you will come to my penis and take the quickening waters flowing from it, you too can be forever happy. <laughs> It's a direct quote. Every time the clouds darken the moon, he urinates, and the people catch his urine in mokulek, birch bark containers, and they drink this liquid that is a gift to them by the Misquito spirits, and much knowledge is revealed in this way. It is Kesu Wabo, the liquid power of the sun. Kesu Wabo. A wow, Jawinda Mao Wining, a wow. This is Kiwe Dinokwe, an Anishinaabek elder. Alright, so that was a lot. We're gonna move on. <laughs> Any questions or comments about that story? Does it seem strange? Like what? What did it tell you about the mushroom, if anything? Yeah. I guess that it can be dangerous, but also can be happiness. Can be dangerous. Can also be a source of happiness. Yeah. Like there's there's actually quite a lot of information baked into that narrative, um, and it comes in a form that isn't familiar to us, like we don't really learn that much cultural information about our own culture through stories like that. Um, but what we'll see is that there's actually like a, a good, there's, there's good biological correlates or pharmacological correlates to that story um, in other perspectives that we can see. So what I'm going to try to do over the, the rest of the lecture is to try to decode some of those elements to you, because a lot of it is pretty strange, right? Like they go up and they get into a cave, but inside the cave there's actually a field, like a field covered in a blue sky. Uh, and the brother turns into a mushroom and he has to go climb a tree and get some feathers. And like, there's a lot of elements in this story and they all, it's like a code basically. Like every single element in that story is, is coding for some other piece of culture in their society that we might not know about, because how, how could we? Um, but all of the elements of the story are there for a reason. Uh, and we're gonna try to, to unpack some of it um, in the next few bits. Um, so, why are they drinking the brother's urine? Right, that's that's the big question. Is that some of you have probably heard this before this story, right? That that Amini Muscari is associated with urine drinking. How many of you have heard that before? A couple of you, three of you. Um, so this is a quote from another pharmacological paper. I think this is a, the other paper that I assigned you. Um, so this can sort of provide a chemical explanation for why that behavior is talked about as it was in this story. So um, after ingestion, ibotenic acid is partially metabolized to muscimol in the organism during the acidic decarboxylation step. We talked about that in the gastrointestinal tract. Afterward, a part of the two compounds is carried to the brain and another part passes through the organism quickly and unmetabolized via systemic circulation. They are then excreted by the kidneys and thus both ibotenic acid and muscimol can be detected in human, human urine collected a few hours after ingestion of mushrooms. In the brain, the same way, in the same way that muscarine is not de de degraded by cholinesterases, Ibotenic acid and muscimol are not effectively removed from the neural synapse by enzymatic systems that remove glutamate and GABA. They are then naturally excreted, and almost all the ingested ibotenic acid and muscimol can be recovered in the urine. Um, 
So I'm going to translate that out of an academic framework into a Teresa is talking to you. Basically what this means is that the, the elements that are psychoactive in the mushroom will pass through the body undigested, basically, um, and end up in someone's urine, um, where they can then be re-ingested, um, often without some of the other, because because Amanita muscari has other toxic compounds in it besides muscimol that I haven't mentioned to you because narrow scope, but there are, there are thousands of molecules in that mushroom, um, and others will make you sick, and they will not make you hallucinate, and they're less desirable. Um, so we can go on. Um, here we have a, a lovely image of a, an elk peeing all over himself um, as it goes. <laughs> um, so, as stated previously, an important part of both ibotenic acid and muscimol is excreted almost intact in the urine. Therefore, the tradition of drinking the urine of a shaman or a reindeer who consumed fly agarics in order to get secondhand stimulus was observed in some Siberian tribes. Drinking a reindeer's urine after it had ingested mushrooms would also help attenuate the unpleasant side effects. The Koryaks, an indigenous people from the Kamchatka Peninsula, were known to carry flasks on their sleigh for this purpose. So there you can see the Kamchatka Peninsula. It's another part of northern Russia. Um, and these people have known for thousands of years that if you drink reindeer piss after they've eaten Amanita muscaria, uh, you might have an interesting time. Um, and how, how would they know this, right? So again, like if we go back, <laughs> Uh, so this is, the story that I read to you is from the Great Lakes, right? So we're talking northern North America, right? And we see the same tradition here, basically on the other side of the world, on the other side of the Arctic, right? So somehow, over the, like a 10,000, 20,000 year history, indigenous peoples in this region have known this fact that if you drink reindeer urine at this specific time, you will get a particular effect. And like, how, how else would you keep that information in your culture? other than a story, if you don't have peer-reviewed pharmacological journals, right? Like, the story holds information for the culture. Um, so, if we can look at that and see this thing about urine, right, there are probably other aspects of the story that can be similarly understood or similarly decoded if we, if we look with the right lens. Um, so we're going to try to understand a few of the other more enigmatic aspects of the story. Um, so here's a pretty simple one, right? This is this is how how the how the text begins, right? Attention, I will tell you a story, a story of the people, a story of mosquito, that red topped mushroom, which is the spiritual child of the Nokomis Gishik, grandmother cedar, and Nimishomis Wiglas, our grandfather birch. Listen and learn. So what does this mean? Right, if you were to translate this into your like more standard mycological rhetoric, like what what would this sentence mean? Here's a picture of the mushroom. Here's a birch. And so, what does this tell us about this species? They grow under birches and cedars. Right. Exactly. Right. So that's pretty simple. Right. And and we can elaborate that a little bit more. We can say, well, this is an ectomycorrhizal species, right? And we know what ectomycorrhizal look like. We've seen them under microscopes. The microrhiza wrap around the roots in a particular way. Right, but this knowledge is also contained in the story in its own way. But obviously, it's framed differently. We're talking about parents, right? Grandmother cedar, grandfather birch, right? So they're associating the ecology of the mushroom with their own family relationships, right? And that is not an accident either. Um, it's just a different way of, of seeing the human relationship to the mushroom. Um, so these are a few that are easy to decode. Uh, to go a little bit deeper, we're going to have to go back to Europe. Uh, and look at the perspective of this man. So this is Merce Eliade. Uh, he grew up in Romania during the interwar period. Um, I have a map of like, this is like a World War II-ish map. Um, so he comes with his own biases. He's, he's one of the more famous mythologists of the 20th century. He was a professor at University of Chicago. Um, he's been criticized for having fascist elements in his writing, but like, if you grew up in interwar Romania, wouldn't you too? Like, so everybody comes with their own biases and their own perspectives. Um, and Eliade did a better job than anyone else I could find as a 30-year-old graduate student living in New York in representing some of these aspects of Siberian shamanism uh, that I want to convey to you. I would love to have primary sources that explain this, but they would only explain it in code. Right, and my purpose here is to decode a little bit. So we're going to rely on what this man has to say uh, in order to try to understand some of the aspects of, of the mosquito story. Um, all right, so 
We're going to be talking about people who live in roughly this area. This is groups of the Altaic language family. Um, this purple here in Japan is the Ainu language. It's not Japanese. Um, so the Altaic language family is, is spread across Russia and, and other regions. Um, and they have a somewhat coherent mythological framework that we can try to unpack here. Um, so in Asia, as in many other parts of the world, the structure of the universe can be understood as a whole having three tiers, heaven, earth, and hell, interconnected by a central axis. The axis passes through an opening or hole by which the gods descend to the earth and the dead into the subterranean regions. It is through this opening that the soul of the shaman is able to fly away or descend during the celestial or infernal journeys. A number of Altaic peoples have imagined heaven is like a tent, the Milky Way is like a seam, and the stars are holes for light. All right, so here's a picture that can sort of evoke uh, what these words, what I, what I interpret these words as getting at, is like, um, there would be rituals that'd be happening in a tent like this, and um, in that context, this would be the entire world, right? So you've got the heaven above, you've got the earth below, um, and the, the tent represents totality. You see this in, in a whole bunch of different religious traditions, right? In ancient Greek, they would call it the omphalos, the world stone, right? There's this, um, an alignment between macrocosm and microcosm, that what is happening in the human mind or in, in the local human domain is reflected in the greater infinite reality out there. Right? And we can see a little bit of this reflected in, in that element of the story that they go into a cave, and inside the cave they're not underground, but they're actually in a field covered by heaven. Right? So there's this notion that like there's, there's realm shifting happening during these rituals. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to talk about it, but that element of, of the, the field inside the cave is not an isolated detail. It, it actually echoes a, a much larger sort of mythological understanding of reality. Um, so we can go a little bit deeper into what Eliade believes these shaman people were doing. Um, all right, I have a lot of text. I'm going to read it to you uh, verbatim because I think it's important. Um, this is coming from people who live in this region of Russia. You can see there's, there's a trend here, right? Um, so the chapter of the book that I took this from, he's talking about shamanic initiations, right? And we can view the Mosquito story also as a kind of shamanic initiation, right? The end of the story, Little Brother has a, a position of social authority where people are taking guidance from him. And in order to do that, he had to turn into a mushroom, right? Um, so. The multiple powers of the shaman are the result of his initiatory experiences. It is thanks to the ordeals of his initiation that future shaman measures the precariousness of the human soul and learns the means to defend it. Likewise, he knows by experience the sufferings provoked by different maladies and is able to identify their causes. He undergoes a ritual death, descends to hell, and sometimes ascends to heaven. The future shaman sees himself as cut up and morseled out by the demons of the illness. In his sickness, he experiences his ritual death in the form of a descent to hell. He witnesses in his dream his own dismemberment. He sees the demons cut off his head and scratch out his eyes. According to the Yakuts who live there, the spirits carry the future shaman to hell and imprison him for three years in a house. It is there that he undergoes his initiation. The spirits cut off his head, which they put aside, because the novice must look with his own eyes as he is torn apart. It's rather gruesome and self-referential. They cut him into little pieces, which they then distribute to the spirits of diverse illnesses. It is only by experiencing this condition that the future shaman will obtain the power of healing. His bones are then covered over again with new flesh, and in certain cases he is also supplied with new blood. Other shamans tell that during their initiatory illness, the ancestral shamans pierce them with arrows, cut their flesh, pull out their bones in order to clean them, or else they open up their stomach, eat their flesh, and drink their blood, and cook their body on a forge on their head with the use of an anvil. During this time, they lie unconscious, nearly inanimate, for three to nine days in a yurt or solitary place. Some seem even to have stopped breathing as they have nearly been buried. Finally, they are resuscitated with an entirely renewed body with the gift of the shaman. Uh, so again, that's a lot of words. Um, what are some takeaways from this? Or do you see any parallels to this with the story that we were looking at earlier? Yeah. Um, well, in the last story, he like, turned into a mushroom. Mm -hmm. And in this story, he's also like being like, torn apart and like, changed around and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So this is, we can see some of this as a metaphor for uh, this uh, chronosymptomology, right? Like, obviously, this is 
given very different language. It's a very different representation of it, but they're, they're describing a near-death experience, basically. Um, there are also some interesting details in here, right? Like it says somewhere over here, pierced with arrows, right? So we have this little detail that like in, in the story, elder brother has to go get feathers from a bird and then has to pierce the mushroom with the feathers. And that is like a, a catalyzing effect that allows him to regain his, his renewed body. Um, so we can, we can go a little bit deeper and then, and then we'll, we'll stop with the, the shamanism. Um, among the most interesting are those of the Buryats. The Buryats are here, um, clear near to Mongolia. The principal rite calls for an ascent. In one, in the yurt, one fixes a solid birch, and the roots set into the hearth and the top emerging from the smoke hole. The birch is named the guardian of the door, for it opens the shaman in his passage to heaven. The apprentice climbs up to the top of the birch, and then going out by the smoke hole, cries with strength to invoke the aid of the gods. Then all those attended, in attendance are directed in procession towards the site, a site set off from the village where a great number of birches have been planted the previous evening of the ceremony. Near one birch, a goat is sacrificed, and the apprentice, naked from the waist up, is anointed with blood from the head, eyes, and ears, while other shamans play the drum. The master shaman then climbs up a birch and makes nine incisions at the top. The apprentice, followed by the other shamans, climbs up in turn. As they mount, they fall or feign to fall into ecstasy. According to one informed source, the candidate must climb nine birches, which symbolize the nine notches and symbolize the nine heavens. Um, so here we can again see reflected this notion that as, as part of the journey, what elder brother has to climb up to the tallest tree. Right, so, so we see that reflected here. And this is not isolated to the Buryat people, right? So this image here, have you, any of you seen an image like this before? I imagine this might be a little bit more familiar to you. Um, this is from Norse mythology, right? So this is uh, a, a, a language map of, of Norse-speaking peoples. Um, so this tree is called Yggdrasil, right? It's surrounded by an Ouroboros. Um, again, it sort of links heaven to hell. Um, and we have this image similar to this image here um, of a tree emerging from a cosmic mountain, right? So this is sort of like a, a symbolic representation of the cosmos. And it is this landscape that the initiate is learning to navigate. Um, and we see this all over the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and it, uh, I think it's quite beautiful, right? Like, clearly, I, I like this symbol. I put it on my body. But um, it's for another time. Uh, all right. So there, there are a few other symbols, right? So these are, these are just uh, associations that I pulled out of my own brain, right? This is me and my bias showing. But like here, we have Prometheus. Um, has anyone heard the story of Prometheus? This is ancient Greek mythology, right? So Prometheus stole fire, right? Fire is a metaphor for like life, energy, wisdom, these sort of things. And his punishment was that he would be chained at the top of a mountain and an eagle would eat his guts, right? Which is not quite the same thing as climb up the tallest tree and get the feathers from the eagle, but like it, there's, there's some evocativeness, right? And here we have from Disney, right? Aladdin in the Cave of Wonders. Um, Aladdin goes into this magical place and he brings back treasures. Um, the inside of the cave is not actually a cave, it's, it's something else. Um, so, and then we have this quote again from the mosquito story. Continue running along the trail until you come to the place where the high trees grow and the eagles nest. Find the highest tree and the nest of the largest eagle. He is a thunderbird. You must obtain four feathers from his tail. Think a prayer to the Thunderbird, a thanksgiving and petition as you keep running towards the mountain. Follow the same trail where the light of the cave shimmers through the opening to the side of the mountain. Right, so my point here is that this, this particular story from the Anishinaabe people has echoes with mythology all across the modern hemisphere, all over where Amanimus Garden grows, right? And interpreting it is not trivial. Right? Like, I, I haven't actually told you anything about what the myth means. Right? So, oh, look, it says something about urine, and there's another thing about ectomycorrhizal relationships. And there, there are things that we can pinpoint. But the bigger point is that that story is instantiated in a particular cultural framework um, that allowed its people to see the world and to understand the other creatures that they were interacting with. Right? And we have other ways of seeing the world. We've got other myths that echo this, but we don't really use these myths in our day to day life in the same way that. Anishinaabe people may have, um, but there are there are ways of translating. This is, is maybe the, the the most simple point that I'm trying to make here. Is you can translate these things um, and understand 
other ways of, of what this mushroom is and might be. Um, so now I'm going to wrap up. I've got a little bit more for you, but are there any, any comments or questions at this point? Yeah. Okay. I just have a question about like the pea thing, honestly. Yeah. Um, so basically, if you like consume the mushroom and then just like keep peeing it out, can you like essentially have like an infinite high, basically? <laughs> yes. My understanding is that yes, that is how it works. Um, that the compounds are bioactive, but they are not broken down, um, and so they can be repeatedly ingested. Um, and from what I've read, that's that's like often you would have a shaman or someone who is prepared to handle the more negative side effects of the Amanita Muscaria, someone who's prepared to go to hell and back and have his body broken apart and rebuilt, right? So the shaman would be the person who would ingest the mushroom originally, and then they would pee, and then they would share their pee with, with the others that they were in ceremony with, um, and, and that would be, that, that was how this, that's how the story came about, is that they, they realized that you could detoxify the mushroom by, by pushing it through a body. Um, uh, there was another paper I read which said that people would also just slaughter their reindeer when their reindeer had consumed this substance, and then they would eat the meat, and they would get the same effect. It doesn't necessarily have to be urine drinking. That's particularly evocative. Um, it's orboric, right? But uh, there, are, there are many ways of, of interacting with the substance. How would you even collect reindeer? Sorry? How would you even collect that? Uh, well, what, what it said here is that the Buryats uh, would carry special flasks on their sleighs for the purpose. Uh, <laughs> so, like, it wasn't like wild reindeer that they were doing. No, domesticated so, reindeer. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Because yeah, I was thinking, like, like, like <laughs> <laughs> this is not a reindeer, by the way. It's just the best gif I could find of a of a artiodactyl peeing. But um, <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So. Now that we have all of that in place, uh, there's a video that I'd like to show you, right? So this is, again, as far as perspectives, this is a video that was produced by The Atlantic. So what does The Atlantic represent? It represents the, the East Coast of North America, right? That's generally, I mean, it's a, it's a North American publication. Um, some of you might have seen this video. Um, but this, what this video is going to do is to try to um, show how our culture is not actually so far from pee-drinking shamans as you might think. Uh, so let's watch this. So, it's the holidays. And I'm thinking about mushrooms. Psychedelic mushrooms. The Amanita muscaria to be exact. Most commonly associated with fairies, gnomes, Alice in Wonderland, and Mario. So what does this magical mushroom have to do with Christmas? It's, it's surprising that uh, it's taken so long for the popular imagination to, to encompass uh, who Santa Claus is. That's Carl Rugg, a scholar known for his work on the influential role hallucinogenic plants have played in mythology and religion. And he believes this mushroom may be one of the reasons we have flying reindeer and an all-knowing man who flies around the globe every winter. Maybe there's another story worth telling this season. What about a psychedelic mushroom eating shaman from the Arctic? At least part of the Santa Claus image comes from Lapalat. And that's Lawrence Millman, writer and mycologist. He says the indigenous people of Lapland, known as the Sami, allegedly performed healing rituals led by shamans who used the hallucinogenic mushroom, the Yamanita muscaria. So imagine it's winter, we're near the North Pole, and a shaman is coming to your house. Long ago, the Sami people believed that the shaman who ate an Amanita muscaria ended up looking like an Amanita muscaria. And he came on a reindeer drawn sled. So he had reindeer and he's looking like a... A big fat person with red splotches in the dead of winter. And instead of entering through the snow block doorway, the shaman would drop down the chimney. What they brought were not physical gifts, but usually healing and problem solving, which would be a kind of gift. And they were rewarded with lots of food. Offerings of food? Kind of like milk and cookies? Mmm, delicious. 
And reindeer have a great love for mushrooms, and especially the males like Amanita muscaria. And one of the effects, uh, I don't know if you've had Amanita muscaria, have you? No, I haven't. Not that I'm recommending it, mind you. Uh, one of the effects makes you feel like you're flying. And one can imagine that that's how reindeer feel as well. So if we're imagining ourselves in a tent right now, there's a fire going, the shaman is in front of us, and the shaman would eat the mushroom, go into a trance, although they would be sitting there beating the drum in the tent, they would be saying, and I'm going down to the underworld and I'm getting advice from so-and-so. So they would get advice from another realm and bring it back to the people and... That would be the gift, as it were, of Santa Claus i.e. person who took the mushroom and ended up looking like the mushroom. This all becomes a kind of melange. You can't really interpret it with, with scientific objectiveness. I should mention, the Amanita muscaria is a highly toxic mushroom, but the urine from reindeer or someone who has consumed it is still highly psychoactive, but without all the toxins. In Siberia, people actually used to drink their shaman's urine to get the effects of the mushroom. The shaman would eat the muscaria, then he'd urinate, and then his followers would get the urine and drink it. And then they would urinate, and their reindeer would follow them around, wanting to drink their urine. So, I'm not suggesting we start drinking Santa's urine. But what we've got here is a shaman from Lapland, which is near the North Pole, who rides a reindeer-drawn sled, enters people's houses through their chimney, eats red and white mushrooms, goes on a trip, and brings back gifts. And the reindeer love this same mushroom, which gives the sensation of flying. Maybe it's time we recognize that our all-knowing Santa, who travels the globe defying space and time, is actually a shaman. Lawrence, how much do you love Christmas? I hate Christmas. <laughs> well, what if we embraced this more shamanistic side of Santa? What would that look like? What I would take away from it, the shaman comes as a healer or to give advice. We should think in terms of regarding Christmas not as a capitalistic holiday, but a time when uh, one should think more spiritually about life, about one's ills, be they psychological or physical. And you, Carl? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you don't know um, the richness of, of our folkloric tradition, you are missing a large part of um, the opportunity you have to know who we are as a culture. And we should know what's going on with Santa Claus that makes it more fun. Maybe this Christmas we can make room for one more story. One about mushrooms, shamans, and ancient rituals. Maybe we should be asking Santa for something different this year. Something more in the tradition of his shaman forefathers. Like time for reflection and looking inward. This is the Amnesia Muscaria. Like the nose on Rudolph. Or the think about the symbolism of Christmas trees and presents under the trees, often wrapped in red and white, much like the Amanita Muscaria goes as an extra mycorrhizal associate under universe trees in the northern hemisphere. And the, easy connection to make. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the thing about the chimney, this, this video didn't really have the space to explore it more, but that was why I did the whole Yggdrasil thing, right? I mean, that's the, this microcosm, microcosm, macro, micro, like it's, it's this. The shaman, oh gosh, where am I? Shaman goes up there, has to climb a birch, comes back down, right? But you see these story elements, right? The, the word used in the video is melange, right? They all get kind of just like shuffled together. You don't really know where their origin is or like what exactly they're referring to, but there's, there's more than meets the eye. Yeah, there are also some suggestions that they're 
like domicile, their outs would have openings near the roof that the urine could be delivered through. So another kind of analogous way to think about Santa delivering presents through the chimney, the shaman is delivering the psychedelic urine to the people inside. Mm -hmm. yes. Any comments? We have two more slides. Okay, so we're going to go back to this idea. So this is again, this is from the ethnographic literature. This idea that the mushroom has a message for people. Um, and okay, so here's three quotes that basically say that. So, Ani Muscar was used to get inebriation as well as to call for the fit of second sight for the purpose of learning something definite. For instance, what ails you, like a lost thing, animal, or person, or whether the latter are dead or alive. To evoke a fit of second sight, Ani Muscar was consumed by wise men. Right, wise men are not educated men from the, from the previous bit, but right? what is wise? What is education? Who knows? Um, another quote, the shaman Bor Borose does not eat Amanita's heart because he wishes to. He is made to eat it by the Amanita spirit who speaks and acts through him. So that's an interesting claim. Um, when the Borose eats the Amanita, then he, the Borose, sings. He who sings is not he, the Borose, but the mushroom. Right, so you see this like actually like very strong insistence that when you eat the Amanita, you become it. Right, that it, it speaks through you. You see that in this, this image of the brother becoming a giant mushroom shape or Santa Claus looking like a mushroom. Right? And it's, it's a hard claim for us to take seriously, um, given, given the way that we are enculturated, like the, this idea that the mushroom actually has a message for us. Um, I certainly couldn't tell you what that message would be, but, but it's, it's made enough times and strongly enough that it, I do think it's worth considering. Um, so that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit, right? Like, if you had to imagine for a moment, like, what is the perspective in the Amanita in all this? What is it trying to accomplish if it's trying anything, right? Like, what, if, if it is a, a teleological creature, if it's a creature with goals, what might those goals be? And how can we understand them? Um, again, there's no right answer to that question, but I'm curious what you think. I guess the one thing I would think is that it would be trying to remind humans about how interconnected everything is and that you don't just live in your own little bubble. Everything you do has an effect on everything else and that that should always be taken into consideration. Yeah, I, I tend to think along similar lines. Um, and it's tricky because like, does, does the fungus actually want that? Like, no, but like, certainly that is a takeaway that can come from interacting with this thing, whether or not you've eaten it. I've never eaten it, but like, it is a thing that I believe. Um, anything else? Silence from the students, come on. All right, well, I've got one more slide for you. This one's a little bit silly. Um, well, what's Teresa's take? On what's this? my take? Yeah. This is my take right here. <laughs> um, the, uh, well, I'll give you my take in a moment. First, we're gonna we're gonna dive back into TikTok. We're gonna look at a little bit more Amanita culture. Um, there's an audio. This audio has been uh, replicated seven thousand and twenty three times. I'll show you the original. Stop telling me that my white freckles don't look realistic. I'm not trying to look realistic, Karen. I'm trying to look like a mushroom so I can attract myself a cute fairy girlfriend. Stop talking about right. them. So y'all know how TikTok works, right? Audios just move through the landscape. So you can see all of these humans have uh, done the same thing. So we can look at this one. Stop telling me that my white freckles don't look realistic. Uh -huh. um, uh, or this one. Stop telling me that my white freckles don't look realistic. Right. Um, and so I'll just keep scrolling through here. Uh, like, I think that there's something quite telling about the fact that so many people feel compelled to look like this, right? That we have this Santa Claus myth, um, that this is only one of the very many Amanita memes that exist on this app. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep scrolling until I find myself on here, because of course I did this. Um, but like, if the mushroom has anything to communicate, like I do think that it would be this kind of like 
I don't know, mythological correspondence? Here I am. Stop telling me that my white freckles don't look realistic. I'm not trying to look realistic, Karen. I'm trying to look like a mushroom so I can attract myself a cute fairy girlfriend. Um, right, so, so the caption that I wrote on that, do you want me to need a... <laughs> <laughs> Um, do Amanita want us to look like them? Like I, going back to that point about coevolution, right? That like we the the evolutionary path that allowed Amanita muscaria to produce a compound that fits like a key in a lock to um, mammalian nervous systems is not known or well studied, right? But we can assume that there is some kind of evolutionary story that can be told, where that compound, it didn't just pop out as muscimol, it must have had several iterations of different biomolecular shapes, right? There was, there was an evolutionary process and probably a co-evolutionary process. Um, so what does that mean the mushroom wants? Like, frankly, like, even though I framed the question that way, like, it's, it's a poorly framed way because the mushroom doesn't want anything, but nonetheless, it's evolved with us, right? And it part of its biochemistry aligns with our biochemistry in a very intimate way. Um, so we are intertwined in the same system, and that's basically what you said, right? And, and we see this not just like in terms of like mushroom empathy, but you see this chemically, um, that our chemistries are linked with it. Uh, so it's intertwined with human culture very deeply. Uh, maybe it wants us to look like it. I don't know. I mean, obviously not. Like, I don't actually think that Amelia Muscaria wants us to look like Amelia Muscaria. That's absurd. But like, I do think it's interesting that even though my guess is that none of these people in these videos know anything about its ethnographic history, they're still part of this pattern, right? Um, that in, in whatever ways we can, we are still imagining what it is like to be a mushroom. Um, and I think the compound helps with that. Potentially, uh, so that's, I don't know, it's hard to speak on that question. That's why I asked it, it's a hard question. <laughs> uh, but that's, yeah, that's all I have. Um, so I'd love to chat with you a bit more, but you all are so quiet. Yeah. Um, what, I, I think just based on like the TikToks, it's kind of evident that like, mushrooms are like a big motif in queer culture. Do you have any like explanation for that or any like reason for the association? Yeah. I do. Um, <laughs> uh, I've made a number of videos about that. Um, mushrooms are pretty queer. Like, if you if you actually like, I've, the the videos that I've made on my channel are largely about the the mechanics of mushroom sex. Um, that like the Sidiomycota have multiple sexes. They have at least four. Um, Schizophyllum commune has twenty three thousand. Uh, what that means is less exciting than what it means in humans, right? It actually just has, refers to mating types and the way that the chemistry works and the genes align. Um, but fungi can change their mating types, right? Like the, the way that they interact with the world is more open, right? Like the, they, I mean that, that goes back to the other lecture that I gave, right? These arbuscles that sort of fuse with everything, like they, they don't have the same kind of self-other distinctions um, that other creatures do, as evidenced by the fact that this, this particular species can get into your brain in like a really strange way, right? Um, so they blur boundaries, uh, and I think in general, queer people are drawn to that. I mean, that's a huge, a huge oversimplification, but like it is striking the number of queer mycologists that I've met. And like, it's not just because I'm trans, like there's, it, it is part of the culture. Um, like, I do think that if you look at fungal life ways, it can tell you something about queerness in, in the human cultural domain. Like, there, there are significant overlaps that, that can be mined. There's academic literature on this. Um, like, there are, there are papers about it. Like, if you're curious about that question, like, you can go pretty deep. Other people have asked it. Um, and the answer is basically that mushrooms are pretty queer. Like, I, that's, that's, that's what I have for you. <laughs> Yeah, I know like with what you said about how like it has an interesting way of getting in your brain, I feel like it's very interesting that the Amelia Muscaria was like almost just like universally like accepted as like a main way to like portray mushrooms. I feel like it could be a way if we're like getting into like how it wanted to communicate with us, a way where it says that it doesn't always have to be like a physical manifestation. So I just think it's interesting like 
how it was like chosen for Mario and we didn't really talk about it, but like it's also like widely used in Minecraft. Like <laughs> I didn't even realize but I was looking at like Emily and Muscari since I was like literally seven years old. <laughs> yeah. And I all the time. But it's just like it, in like almost all video games where like Mushroom's playing aspect, it's the Ami and Muscaria, which I feel like it's just like interesting how that came to be. Mm -hmm. Which could just be like a way where it's just like somehow like it's getting into our brain in other ways besides just like physically seeing it or investing it. Absolutely, right? Like there's a reason why it's the mushroom emoji, right? Like I was able, if I was giving a lecture about any other species, I wouldn't be able to do this. I'm like, well, I'm just gonna use the emoji instead of the Latin name because I can, right? There aren't that many emojis in the world. Like it's, it has mimetic power for sure, right? Like we're all aware of its mimetic power. Many people are aware of its mimetic power even if they're not even aware that it's like a basidiomycete or, or any of the technicals. Like it does, like it's, it's, wormed its way into our culture and like that that in and of itself is a kind of power right like a kind of message that it has and it's not just because of its shape or its color and part of it is like red and white is very pretty it's not just because it's psychoactive like it, it's all of these things um yeah i think that's very insightful thanks well it's the end of the class period. Yeah, so I will say I posted some extra slides on ethnomycology that you're responsible for. So Teresa's lecture is titled Ammonite and Scaria, and I uploaded a separate presentation called Ethnomycology that also has some examples beyond Ammonite and Muscaria, like uh, Cynalosophy mushrooms and a few other examples. So make sure you look over both of those presentations uh, out of the exam. Uh, and read all of the required readings. Should have done it before today. I'll just let you do it before Monday. <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to go to the other room to check. Does anybody have mushrooms that they want to show me? You do. Great. Um, so I'll go over there, and we can hang out and look at mushrooms. And um, do DM me uh, your iNaturalist posts and your TikTok videos, and then I will grade them. Thanks, Rita.